Israeli troops pulled out of the city of Jenin in the occupied West Bank early this morning after carrying out the largest military operation in decades aimed at destroying Palestinian militants' weapons and infrastructure sites. Drone footage from this morning shows hundreds of men marching in a funeral procession through the streets of that city, mourning the 12 Palestinians killed in the operation, among them at least five militant fighters. An Israeli soldier was also killed in the fighting. As is often the case in this decades-long dispute between the Israelis and Palestinians, an act of violence from one side prompts retaliatory responses. Militant group Hamas praised a car ramming and stabbing in the Israeli city of Tel Aviv that followed yesterday. A large explosion was seen over Gaza City this morning after Israel reported it intercepted rockets fired at Israel from Gaza. The Israelis striking back with the government reporting it hit a weapons factory in Gaza early today. And NBC's Matt Bradley has the latest from Janine following the troop withdrawal. Matt, with tons of praise for you for your brave reporting on the ground. I want to get to you in a moment. We're also joined by Aaron David Miller, the senior fellow in the American Statecraft Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, also a former State Department analyst who worked on Arab-Israeli peace efforts. Matt, you were there. You were on the front lines. You witnessed the Israeli forces as they moved in there, surprising not just the journalists, but certainly a lot of the Palestinians on the ground. What is the latest in Janine right now? What are you seeing in the day after those Israeli forces pull out? Well, I have to tell you, Peter, we're actually in Jerusalem right now. We left Janine a few hours ago, but we were there all day. And what we saw was extraordinary. I mean, we saw a community of people, of Palestinians, who were quite literally and figuratively picking up the pieces of what was left out of, the, out of that extraordinary two-day incursion by the Israelis into Janine. And, you know, this was a, a very interesting thing to witness because for them, for the Palestinians, the fact that the Israelis left after only about 48 hours, they took that as a sign of victory. You mentioned just a moment ago how Hamas had claimed and praised that attack in Tel Aviv against civilians. Well, they've also said... Uh, just in the last couple of hours, Hamas coming out with a statement saying that the, the, the militants were victorious, and that's why the Israelis finally left. And actually, when we spoke to Palestinians in Janine, not just in the city of Janine, but actually in that refugee camp that was the focus, the real target of the Israeli incursion, they had that feeling that they were victorious, that, they, that the Israelis left because they pushed them out. Now, Benjamin Netanyahu last night came out, of course, said that the Israelis had basically had a mission accomplished and that he left open the door for further incursions by the Israelis into Janine and other places in the West Bank. You also mentioned that, you know, one of the real risks here was a tit for tat or a retaliation. We did see that a little bit. Uh, we saw rockets fired last night from the Gaza Strip into Israel proper and then the Israelis answered with their own rockets or their own missiles fired into Gaza. But that was brief and that really just showed that this situation, at least at this very moment, might not spill over out of Janine in any real way into other places. Mm -hmm. if you, as you've seen before in the past, this same pattern of violence often creates a response, not necessarily just from the West Bank, but also from the Gaza Strip. And that can lead to days, weeks of exchanging of rockets and missiles back and forth, which tends to result in thousands of Palestinian deaths and can result in some Israeli deaths as well. So we, for the moment, seem to have avoided that kind of fate. But there is a lot yeah. of tension there. And walking around in Janine, in that city, seeing people sweeping up the dust and the soot right. from all of those burning fires, from the tear gas that was fired by the Israelis, watching them repair windows, they seem like a population that is just inured. It's just used to violence. And for them, this was just another day in a very violent life. And well, Aaron, so, Aaron, you know, th this is a situation that I think is just going to be on repeat. Yeah, Aaron, I was going to say to you, it does feel like that to, to much of the, the rest of the world watching what we saw there. Obviously, this was a, a larger scale effort by the yeah. Israelis in Janine. But, but what does happen now? Um, Prime Minister Netanyahu, he said that this is just the start of operations in that area. What are you preparing to witness happen next here? This is part of, a, of an ongoing peace, uh, and I think the situation is, again, is going to get worse before it gets even worse. You've got three factors driving the situation. None of them can be ameliorated anytime soon. Number one, you have a Palestinian authority that is unwilling and unable to exercise its security control 
particularly in the northern West Bank, particularly in a city like Janine, the third largest city in the West Bank. Number two, you have the most right-wing fundamentalist government in the history of the state of Israel that is pursuing a policy of of trying to annex the West Bank in, in uh, everything except name only. And um, number three, you have uh, a the emergence of informal uh, groups of young men, 15 to 25, not uh, organizationally uh, affiliated with Hamas or Palestine Islamic Jihad, but being encouraged by them, which are, are putting up a remarkable sort of resistance and maintaining the capacity to carry out attacks against Israel in the West Bank and, um, and Israel proper. So the, the fact is, I, I don't want to trivialize by saying this because people were killed uh, and many innocent Palestinians wounded, but this is a wash, rinse, and repeat cycle, which yeah. is only going to get worse. No massive sustained third intifada, I don't think, but just a long slog Aaron. of daily, weekly confrontations between the Israeli Defense Forces and organized and unorganized Palestinian groups. But, Aaron, this is a bit striking, right, having been in that region with the president only a matter of months ago, right, in the wake of the Abraham Accords, where Israel's had a new normalizing of relations with a variety of countries there, even the potential for some sort of relationship to develop with Saudi Arabia. It it appears now that Iran, again, has been sort of fueling this effort on the Palestinian side. What is the state of the Palestinian people, though, right now? They, They are a people without a home there, as Israel has been building its relationships throughout that region is this sort of Iran and the Palestinians' effort, you know, uh, to 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 continue to fight back. I guess independent of that effort. Look, not every national movement. We've seen it in the case of the Armenians and the Kurds find find their national aspirations fulfilled and requited. And Palestinians, in my judgment, the least bad option, frankly, is uh, the pursuit of a two-state solution. But frankly, under these circumstances, that's virtually impossible. So you have a divided Palestinian national movement. You have two of everything. Mm-hmm. It's like Noah's Ark. You've got two constitutions, one in Hamas controlling Gaza, one in uh, the West Bank uh, by Fatah. You have two sets of security services and two sets of patrons. So it's virtually impossible for me to uh, believe that you were going to have a unified Palestinian national strategy. And even if you did, you have a government in Israel that is unwilling to even meet basic or minimum Palestinian needs and requirements. So what should the U.S. role then, Aaron? So what should the U.S. role then be in this region vis-a-vis you know, this conflict? You know, I, I, I worked for half a dozen secretaries of state of both political parties. My days of providing advice to the United States, frankly, <laughs> is, is over. I would only say this to you, that governing is about choosing. It's deciding mm-hmm. what your priorities are. And at this moment, this administration with a president running for a second term, with a dysfunctional yeah. political climate of hyper-partisanship, with Russia and Ukraine and a rising China. Frankly, if you were Mr. Biden, you would wish, if you had a wish, that you wouldn't hear from Israelis or Palestinians at least mm-hmm. until 2025. I think that, unfortunately, is is probably the way that the priority system works right now with the situation in Russia and Ukraine. So urgent, the real fears about the situation in China as well. Matt Bradley on the ground for us in Jerusalem now, safely out of the West Bank. Aaron David Miller, always a pleasure to get your perspective and hear your expertise. Thanks for making time to talk to us. That's going to do it. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.